Welcome to the 2021 Virtual Materials Research Society Spring Meeting. We are going to have a full week of live symposium sessions, keynote and award talks, a dynamic and exciting virtual exhibit, and much more. This is MRS TV. Welcome to the sixth episode of MRS TV. With just two days to go, this year's Materials Research Society Spring Meeting has been full of great sessions, interviews, and special features. From cutting edge to innovations in materials imaging to revolutionary research in self-healing polymers, our members are dreaming to make the world a little bit cleaner, inclusive, and improve the global quality of life. Today we are featuring a conversation with MRS Spring Meeting Chair Shaolin Li and we dive into the evolving world of green energy with the Hydrogen Materials Compatibility Consortium. But first, let's look at some of the highlights from today's meeting events. In addition to another full day of technical sessions, today features more exhibit hours where you can meet with our exhibitors. Make sure to tune into today's Symposium X keynote talk with E. Choi on nanotechnology for sustainability, followed by the announcement of our 2021 virtual MRS Spring Meeting Best Poster winners and the winner of the Science as Art competition. Find all of these events and more on the MRS virtual meeting platform. We now welcome MRS 2021 Spring Meeting Chair Shaolin Li. Welcome and thanks for joining us. Yeah, it's uh, really nice to meet you virtually, all chair. Well, at long last, the meeting you've been working towards for several years is here. And this certainly wasn't the typical path toward an MRS meeting. Tell us about the journey that you took as a meeting chair to get to this day. So I think it all started uh, back in 2019, September. And then we went through the uh, pandemic. And um, so at the beginning, we don't know whether this is going to be an on-site meeting or it's going to be an online meeting, you know, at the beginning of 2020. But, you know, still, we kind of went through the whole process. And so finally, we get this program um, uh, done. So it's pretty good experience. So we get about... Uh, 55 symposia and um, also now we have more than 3,000 regist uh, people registered for the meeting. So that is really uh, something wonderful. We know there's a lot of work involved in being an MRS meeting chair. Why did you volunteer for the role? Uh, first of all, I have been um, involving in the MRS um, for a long time. So starting as a, a student or postdoc and uh, to attending the meetings and uh, to present there, and uh, this is a really uh, wonderful uh, platform. So, you know, I really enjoy the experience and to serve the, the entire MRS community. So I think uh, at a certain point, then I feel, oh, uh, you know, maybe I want to um, serve as a meeting chair. So it will brought my uh, interaction, not only with the people that in my own field, uh, but also uh, the broader MRS uh, research community. What advice would you have for future MRS meeting chairs? I'll say some of my experience, um, you know, working with uh, co-meeting chairs, working with the symposium organizers and uh, with MRS uh, leadership and staff. Um, it's, it's really, um, as I mentioned, it's an honor to serve and it's also a pleasure, uh, exp a pleasant experience. And, uh, um, also, it's a learn. It's a very good learning experience too. So I think uh, I would really encourage uh, people. You know, um, whether you are at your early uh, career stage or you are, um, you know, uh, at your mid career or even late career. So to volunteer and to serve uh, the community is really good. Obviously, the pandemic has had a drastic effect on the meeting, but for you personally, how has this affected your day-to-day -day work? I think the pandemic definitely uh, changed a lot of things. So now we don't have face-to-face um, um, -face meetings. You know, um, everything is going virtual. Also in uh, life, you know, like a family um, too. So, right, so uh, I have two small kids and um, they are in first grade. Uh, so that's quite uh, th that's quite some challenge, you know, to manage uh, the work and the life 
Um, but I, I think, you know, after a year, we have learned and we have improved, um, you know, to, to get used to it. And I think uh, also for this meeting, too, it, it's, a, it's a challenge. It's a journey, uh, but we make it. Can you tell us what events or topics you are most looking forward to at this meeting? Oh, yes. In the energy and sustainability cluster. So, you know, we focus on the catalysis of sustainability. And also we focus on the battery safety and sustainability. There are quite some symposiums there. And uh, for the batteries, I want to mention, we have a focus symposium on solid state battery and um, on aqueous battery and also on intercalation chemistry beyond um, lithium ion battery. So, and also for the nano scale material and uh, quantum material uh, cluster, uh, we have two symposiums uh, focusing on the uh, superconductor. Uh, Again, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. There are a number of initiatives around the country and federally to decarbonize our energy sector. And this is a huge challenge if we consider the amount of petroleum and natural gas that we use. One of the ways that we can try to decarbonize some of these energy sources is to consider hydrogen as a replacement for natural gas and petroleum. Hydrogen is the future, actually. I think hydrogen has every potential to really uh, revolutionize the whole world and really change the way the world operates right now. Part of this effort to look at decarbonization is something called H2 at scale, which is a Hydrogen Fuel Cell Technologies Office initiative to look at the potential role for hydrogen in the broader energy sector to support everything from transportation to manufacturing to, to even supporting the electrical grid. And there are a number of different initiatives under um, H2 at scale, one of which is the Hydrogen Materials Compatibility Consortium called HMAT. In order to have a robust infrastructure, we need to have materials that are compatible with hydrogen. And HMAT is allowing us to be able to look at the effects of hydrogen under high pressure, uh, extreme atmospheres that these materials would be subjected to. Our program is looking at how we might be able to make these materials more robust and more reliable in our hydrogen infrastructure by understanding these mechanisms that hydrogen play within the materials. HMAT um, does a really good job like bringing uh, multi-national uh, lab efforts so we can really leverage um, you know, unique capabilities and resources from different national labs. While Sandia National Laboratories in California and Pacific Northwest National Laboratory uh, are the two leads of the HMAT program, Argon National Laboratory, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and Savannah River National Laboratory are also contributors to this HMAT effort at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. We're currently focusing on the polymer side of the, this effort. Um, in, trust with, uh, in contrast with metals, polymers have been uh, last studies, um, and there, there are very little of literature research done in the, in the polymer side. We use these materials as barrier liners, whether it's in a high pressure pressure vessel to store hydrogen, whether it's in a hose liner, so you could refuel a vehicle, or transport it from one container to another, or sealing um, with, with an O-ring in, in a valve, or, or a compressor you know, being able to resist the changes in its material properties as it's changing pressure from one stroke to the next under, under different temperature conditions. All these materials um, need to be stable and, and reliable during operations in hydrogen atmospheres. We have this uh, very new and advanced uh, capabilities called in situ tribometer that really measures the uh, friction and the wear and especially tri uh, tribological performance of polymers in situ in hydrogen because hydrogen is hard to measure after postmortem. So um, we can really understand real time how material performance and how they wear, how they um, damage in hydrogen um, at, in the dynamic situation. The scientists here are wanting to understand the uh, reaction with the hydrogen with their, their polymers, so we use uh, ion microscopy to uh, help them understand the uh, issues with hydrogen with their materials. Um, one reason we use uh, the ion microscope over the electron is, is that uh, 
we can neutralize the charge effect that the polymer has in a scanning electron microscope with electron flood gun. And the ion microscope gives us a little better channeling um, contrast so we can understand some of the light elements that are present in these polymers. We also look at uh, cryogenic materials testing down to 20 Kelvin so we can understand how the material behaves in both composites and resin systems and metals in a hydrogen environment that's for liquid hydrogen storage or cryogenic compressed. One of the capabilities that we have at Sandia National Labs in California is a laboratory we call the Hydrogen Effects on Materials Laboratory. And in this laboratory we have some very unique capabilities where we can do fundamental mechanical testing in very in situ and very high pressure hydrogen environments. So we can do standard fatigue and fracture type testing that industry does every day. We can do that testing within a hydrogen environment at pressures in excess of 100 megapascal, which is a, a pretty high pressure. In addition to some of the experimental capabilities, we also have extensive computational capabilities because the national labs have access to some of the most powerful computing facilities. Looking at these uh, phenomena from a, from a very high fidelity level, even at the atomistic scale. Nations around the world are aggressively pursuing hydrogen technologies as a way to decarbonize. HMAT labs have been leading materials compatibility research for decades and have formed many strong partnerships with other labs, companies, and universities worldwide to inform our work. We are always welcoming new partners and want to coordinate our research activities with them since decarbonization is a global imperative. I'm very excited to be working on this uh, project because I believe um, the hydrogen can really change the way this world operates. And in many years, I might be able to tell my friends and my family, even my kids, that I'm part of it, I'm making it a reality now. It's, uh, it's you know, just really changing the world.